calling the uh, Joint Investment Retirement Board to order. 705. Uh, first item is to approve uh, our minutes from the um, Wow, we didn't approve the special meeting. No, we had, yet. yeah. And um, May 27th. So let's uh, let's get that done. <clears throat> uh, Brian, do you need a motion? We do. I was just looking at the um, special. I, I could. I. I, I can make a motion to approve the uh, special uh, meeting uh, minutes. Yeah, because they were corrected. And, um, exactly. Right. And they look good. Do we have a second? I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? So moved. So, uh, last month's minutes. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Um, it's Carolyn. I'm happy to make a motion to approve the, those minutes. Thank you, Carolyn. I did hear you. Um, do I have a second? I'll, I'll second, Jack. Oh. Thank you, Jack. Um, Trevor? Can I get a vote all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Thank you, everyone. So that takes us to um, actuarial RFP follow up and schedule. Um, did Gerald? I didn't ask Gerald, uh, who's I think is one of the head folks in the um, procurement office. I want to know if he needed to attend. I I didn't. Um, I didn't think he needed to. It's, uh, you know, we just need the town to do the RFP and there are some samples that we can send to him. Um, I don't know. If Brian, I, talk, I talked to, um, to uh, Daryl. He said Caitlin had information. I do. I didn't catch so all that. I kind of a time frame from him. I'm not sure what you guys were thinking of in terms of a time frame, but I got information from him. I got our old RFP that's clearly, you know, 12 years old or so. Um, he reached out to a couple of communities to get their samples of RFPs. Um, I think we got Norwalk and one from Plainville, I believe. Um, my concern is with the timing, and I'm not sure, like I said, what you guys think of in terms of timing. Um, I also reached out to my auditor on the financial side for the town because there is a major piece that comes from the actuaries. So I wanted to know his thoughts on that as well. He know he needs all of his um, the accounting reports from the actuaries by November 1st. I circled back with um, Carol. We talked about the timing that was involved with the OCIO RFP, just because that's something that you guys are familiar with and what you guys just completed. That one took a lot longer than I thought um, from start to finish. Um, Gerald provided me a timeline of that RFP which Dan, he received his request to prepare an RFP on November 26th of 2018, just to give you a feel. There was, I guess, a bunch of drafts, but um, the RFP was finalized on April 10th of 19, so almost six months later. 
There is also a um, time frame of a couple weeks for questions that the um, companies who submit responses to the RFP do. And then there's a deadline for submissions, which is approximately um, about four weeks after the RFP is finalized. The first set of interviews for the OCIO was October 3rd of 19. The second set was December 11th of 19, and the final set was January of 2020. The award was that January meeting from you guys, and the new agreement clearly with Vanguard was April of 2020. I, yeah, I don't anticipate this being that hard. It's a pretty simple RFP, and uh, we'll probably select two or three to uh, come in and present, if that, and uh, make it. And, um, and hopefully, uh, it, sh it shouldn't be that hard to put together either. Um, I'm not really going to comment on the OCIO or the uh, defined contribution RFPs. I think there were some issues there that um, hopefully won't get repeated this time. Um, it's literally an RFP for actual services for a defined benefit public pension plan. And um, we're going to make sure it gets delivered to uh, four or five identified um, companies who can do the work and hopefully they'll uh, submit their bid and that should speed things up. <clears throat> okay, I agree. So the timing with what Gerald said normally for a normal RFP, the prep time he said normally is three to four weeks to customize it. Then you issue the RFP, and there's normally three to four weeks for the responses to come in, one to two weeks to review, and then your short list for the interviewers. Great. I mean, we, so we, we, had put, we, had, we had voted on it last month, so I, that's why this was an RFP uh, follow-up to see what had happened, and it sounds like not much has happened. So um, I guess... Well, we have samples. The one from 12 that we did is going to require a ton of work just because it's so old. Our pension didn't change. And, a, a, well, a lot has changed in terms of the accounting requirements for our auditors. Because there's been new GASB pronouncements since then. So there is that. Yeah, I, I, it's not Caitlin, I, the valuation. Caitlin, any, any actuarial firm that can do public pension actuarial services, I'm not going to put in every line item that they have to do. They can either show that they're qualified to do public pension actuarial jobs or they're not. And if they are, they know all the GASB requirements. So um, I think the less... Uh, detail that's put in there, I think the better off we're going to be. If there's some kind of special sauce that we need, then certainly we better make sure that that's in there. But um, I mean, I, I got one from the state of Connecticut, too, that he can use. It's got lots of special sauce in it. But um, Brian, is there any specific language that we need to include based on our experience with H&H &H that we want to make sure is in that document? Um, no, uh, you know, we expect uh, actuaries to follow ethical conduct. I mean, that's not something I think we need to to put in there. We can always ask people when they come and, and do at, their presentation, but. Um, at the RFP level, would we would we outline reporting to the board, outlining and that kind of stuff? Because I think that was our main concern with H&H &H and what they reported to us and then what they reported to a, a different body kind of screwed us. So is there is, is that within the RFP or is that after the contract is signed or as part of the contract? We'll make sure, like exactly in the contract, the engagement letter. Okay. It'll be very clear who uh, who they're who is engaging them and who is paying for them. And I think that uh, that could have resolved some of the stuff that happened the last time. Okay. But as far as uh, reporting something different to two different bodies, that's a violation of a uh, actuarial code of ethics. In case anybody's wondering. Anyway, um, I want to belabor that. Um, so if Mr. Foley's got some stuff, I, I wouldn't mind him uh, touching base so I can I can get his schedule for when he's going to be sending the stuff out so we can kind of, I can keep tabs at least from my end. And actually, I'll include um, Carolyn Chibuco and uh, Ken Brackball on that. So there's, he's not just tied down to one person so we can uh, see that thing get done. All right. Next item. Why did I lose it? Where'd it go? Oh, 
uh, we're on to the Vanguard section of the world. So um, that's your uh, that's your cue, Mr. Uh, Binkley. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just a quick check. Yeah, everyone can hear me okay? Okay. Thanks. So uh, for today's agenda, I had three items. I just gave a committee, the retirement board, an update on where we were with the transition plan that we decided on at the last meeting. I'll do a quick review of performance through the end of May. And then we we're planning to spend the lion's share of the meeting discussing private equity, both was requested back in the March meeting, and then just to dig into the Harbor Vest Vanguard Fund. And uh, please interject any time as we're going through this. And as I mentioned at the top of the meeting, I have two of my colleagues on, Brian Scott, the investment analyst supporting the town, and then our product manager for private equity, Ariel Feingold. So with that being said, um, I uh, the first item is just up to me, us uh, update the committee. So we've been working hard behind the scenes. I want to thank Caitlin. There's been a lot of paperwork that had to be signed uh, for authorized signers. But the main update is we've been in constant contact with the seven managers that we plan to liquidate as of 630. Uh, and also a lot of coordination with People's Bank to make sure all the wires are received. So again, the plan uh, for 630 is to liquidate, liquidate the seven public equity and fixed income managers. The only uh, manager that we cannot liquidate at this point is Wellington because they only have quarterly liquidity with a 45 day notice. So that would not take place until September 30th. Uh, again, uh, everything is, is on track. Uh, Carolyn and Ken and Brian has been involved at some point and then Caitlin almost on a daily basis this uh, last two weeks. So feel very comfortable where that is. And then the benefit of trading everything on 630 is that as of 7-1, the new fiscal year, that will only include the new managers, the four Vanguard funds we talked about the last meeting, the private equity and the private real estate investments stay as is. Excellent. And uh, thank you, uh, Caitlin, for, yeah, she's, um, because of some uh, administrative stuff that we are trying to work out, it's a, it's a fair amount of work. Um, just getting all the signatures and stuff for this uh, transfer assets, and she's um, she's been doing a yeoman's job. And I um, and on that also, Caitlin, I I have not heard back from uh, Baldwin on the legal document. I got nothing. Did did I? Did you see? See on vacation? I have right? not heard anything. Um, I have not heard anything. I have not actually heard from him at all. So that's a good point. Um, I could I could see if he's out. And if so, for how long? Yeah, because we got to get it. <laughs> we need it time, right? Yeah. yeah, by uh Friday. So um, at which I'm okay with, but I wanted him to. I mean, in the email, I said, you know, I pointed out what I saw in the document and um, tried to explain what it was, but um, uh, it's today's Wednesday, so <clears throat> anyway, sorry, yeah. didn't want to. Oh. Thanks for that reminder. Yeah, so then on the Vanguard presentation, I'll start on page four. And I'll, again, I'll keep the comments on performance high level. So on page four, where, where are we with the capital markets through our la since our last meeting? Uh, the equity markets have you know, clawed back, so continue to claw back returns. So I'm on page four, looking at the middle teal bar, since this is a year-to-date figure. So U.S. stocks, as of the end of April, we we're down over 10%, where U.S. stocks are now down a little over 5% as of the end of May. They've made up more ground here in June. And then you see international stocks have continued to lag down over 14% through the end of May. Uh, U.S. bonds are the fixed income. Uh, they're up. They're really the only asset class you know, showing positive returns besides alternatives, but the public side fixed income up 5.6%. Page five, just highlighting within the US, the you know, was riskier segments of the market. 
and here illustrated by small cap, mid cap, that continues to lag larger cap names, which are seen as more of a flight to safety uh, that can more global in nature. So uh, just to show that small cap is, is lagged large cap by a good degree. So that'll bring you to page six where, you know, where we can address the, the towns, the pension plan performance. You know, last month we were at 366 million. So we're up 11 million at 377 million. From a fiscal year to date basis, just shy, just negative by a little down 77 basis points. And that's lagging the pension policy benchmark by just, just a tad over 100 basis points. That underperformance, you know, it's going to be both from an attribution standpoint, both from an asset allocation, you can see we're still underweight at US equities a little bit due to the sell-off. Uh, and then there's been some relative underperformance. It's been, it's been mixed. So if you were, I'll jump back to page six in a moment, but if you're say on page seven, we've had some good active performance from the likes of American Pacific. That is outperformed on a year-to-date basis, even though international equities is, are lagging. Uh, Sykes has outperformed here on, on a fiscal year-to-date basis. Uh, but what's not on this report, because it was terminated in the last month, was the Allianz strategy. And that's why it's not showing as of May. And that Allianz strategy was on a one-year basis, end of April was down. Uh, I had written down, um, it was down over 35%. So, you know, that'll obviously have some impact on the, on the relative performance. If I was on page eight, you know, the private investments lag. So private equity is still showing, you know, strong positive returns. And from an absolute perspective, that'll add to your performance versus say something like the, when we get to the OPEP performance. I'm going to go back to page six for just a moment, just to update you, the committee um, on one other item. So our allocations are pretty close, or you know, within. Can I, can I just ask a quick question on the macro side? Yeah. yeah. On the international, um, you point out how the U.S. is like only uh, like five, five and change down, but uh, international is like fourteen or whatever. It's double digits. Is that? Um, I mean, I know we've got some bifurcation, significant bifurcation in our markets, depending on what names you're in. Is there any rhyme or reason in the international space? Is it um, is it particular yeah. continents or, you know, is it the euro area or is it just? Uh... Yeah, good question. You know, one of the big disparities is the sector weightings are different between international and U.S. markets. Uh, you know, the best one to pick on is like tech. So in IT is a very big part of the US markets and that being a growth sector has really outperformed. Whereas the international markets, not as heavy on tech, a little bit more towards value, you know, some big energy names, uh, banks make up a big constituent of the European markets. So there's some sector weightings that are certainly weighing on things as well as some just overall fragility. Um, you know, say a big country like Germany, very dependent on global trade. Uh, so those are some of the nuances I would point to of why the international markets have lagged the US. So just coming back to page six, um, you see the asset allocation, very close to uh, all of our targets. That's something that we'll continue to monitor on a going basis. And then in uh, what this May report does not reflect is last week we raised approximately 1.9 million and we took that from the overweight sector, global fixed income, and that was raised in advance to pay benefits on July 1st. So that's just one thing that wouldn't be reflected here. If I brought you to page 10, and again, interjecting time, page 10, just looking at the OPEB performance, different asset allocation, meaning a little bit more heavily towards the equities. So on a fiscal year to date, it's positive, up 53 basis points. It's lagging the, the policy target, which was up 101. And that was really due to, if you went to page 11, 
PIMCO, uh, you can see on a fiscal year to date towards the middle of the page on 11, has been lagging their index. So that's the, I was gonna call the only really active strategy within the, uh, the OPEB. Yes, we have private real estate, but I was just talking about the public side. So that would explain the un relative underperformance. Uh, I'll pause again to see if there are any questions. Okay. Here and then I was gonna flip towards next section on page, starting at page 30, 13 on private equity. And the March meeting, there were some questions when we talk, discussed private equity to provide some background on what other public funds are doing and how they allocate to this private space. And this is all public available. Um, most of it's publicly available. I'm glad to forward on any individual reports. They're all sourced. So if we're on page 13, this is looking at state and local pension plans. And on the right hand side, you could see the allocation to private equity for publics is 9.3% as the most recent data. So that gives you a sense of their overall asset allocation. You do see uh, some private real estate at about 9% as well. If you were to turn to page 14, just to give you a, se a sense as far as the type of investors, is public pension funds, really due to their size, especially when you consider the state level, you know, is, is really the biggest investor in private equity. Uh, that's illustrated in that, the far left bar on page 14. Uh, again, a lot of uh, big public state plans, uh, their return targets I typically see in excess of 7%, and uh, they're worse funded than a lot of the local plans. And I would say that they're using public equity to help you know, fill that return gap. Uh, and also on page 15, it gives you a sense of well, what are publics thinking about? This is specific to private equity, the different bars. So the second bar in is the public pension funds. And you see that 49% of them are considering increasing their allocation. And the other half is about just to keep that allocation the same. Uh, I mentioned, I was gonna to go to page 16. We may have touched on this slide in, um, at the last meeting, and certainly when we're thinking about asset allocation, and even when we're thinking about the Harbor Best Fund that area will dig into, is both the absolute returns and then the relative returns or the, or the ability to outperform. And so looking at global equity towards the right center, if you were looking at that, this is over a 10 year time frame. that orange bar, which is the median, you can see how that's slightly above public equities. And there's a wide disparity. That's the biggest thing that jumps off the page when you come to alternatives, that manager selection becomes even more a key component of that. Because if you were to get a manager that's say below median, you're really not adding anything over the public mar markets. So manager selection becomes such a more important component when you're talking about alternatives, especially since you can't index there. And that's gonna lead in more towards what we're gonna describe uh, when we get into our partner, HarborVest, which uh, their track record has certainly been over that medium of over the 35 course of their history. Um, for a later time, also I'll stay on page 16, you can see core real estate, which will, I think we'll get to in another meeting. You know, even core real estate has pretty tight returns, but when you get into non-core real estate and principal would fall into that, they consider themselves as a core plus manager, you have some wider disparity. And then on page 17, this was a question from Ken back in March was, do you have any, in, any information that how private equity does in down markets? And this is a, a recent blog that we put out no more than a month ago that I'm happy to forward to the committee. And this is a chart taken from that. And it shows not this drawdown, but the last three kind of big bubbles or down markets, the solid line, whether it's 
yellow or blue or teal, that's US equities, the public markets. And then any of the dotted or dashed lines or be the private equity. And you could see that in each of those three instances or, or corrections, that private equity did not draw down as, uh, as much as the public markets. Uh, of course, some of that is gonna do to the lagged performance, uh, but nonetheless, that does benefit an overall portfolio. Hey, Brian, I've, I've got a question. It's Jack Mahoney. With these, hey, um, with these pr private assets, um, is there ever a worry, or have you guys ever had a conversation around the valuation, the valuation methods? Yes, as far as how do you measure performance versus like, say like IR? Yeah, how, how, how do you measure it and who's, yeah, how do you measure it? Not, not to get into that deep discussion and, and who's doing the measurement and, you know, is there a possibility that, that um, I mean, it's not like it gets compliant, right? Um, is anyone, is anyone going in and validating their, their valuations? Uh, they do, yeah. they do have to be audited and if that was Ariel, I'll let you jump in. Yeah, this is Ariel Feingold. I'm happy to jump in. I think the valuation method, um, this is a, a great question and a valid question that came up a lot in the due diligence process and looking at PE managers. And your point is a fair one in that across PE managers, there's variability in valuation methods. And so, and so part of looking at a manager, and we can jump into this in a minute with HarborVest, was trying to understand the process, the firm by which, uh, who is auditing the valuation methods, the transparency and reporting for how their um, valuing assets is coming back to Vanguard as part of our partnership was also part of that. And there were varying levels in our due diligence process and picking a partner of willingness to share um, valuation methods, uh, meaning uh, reasons behind meaningful write downs or write up and a very open and transparent conversation with the partner who would work with us so we could be able to provide that level of information to clients. So it, it comes down to willingness to share that level. And it's, um, as Brian said, it's audited, it's verified by a third party. They have a strong process for conducting it. And not every manager had the same level of rigor and transparency as for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Ariel. Well, you know, with that, I was really going to segue more into the actual Harbor Vest Fund. Uh, any other questions for the from the committee just on the background of the, the universe and public funds in general? Okay. Um, yeah. I, I just was going to um, plant this seed for future discussions, but if you go back to page uh, 16 on um, dispersions and averages. Um, this is a 10 year snapshot. So no one's, I mean, it could be longer, but whatever, it's 10 years, that's a, it's a decade. Right. Um, just wanna show folks that, I mean, generally you could cuff equities at 10% and um, cuff uh, fixed income at 3%. And if you do that and you're in a 60, 40, you're at 7.2%. Right, you got 6% coming from your equity contribution, 10% times your 60, and you're, if you use 3% on your fixed income, 40% 40, 40 of that's 1.2, so that's 7.2. And then the rest of the stuff to your right, uh, and with the exception of hedge funds, is, is basically accretive, um, especially for us, right, because we're, we're really um, private equity and real estate. Um, right. So when you, people are like, well, you know, what's our you know, 7%, a good discount rate and all that stuff. Um, this is kind of like a back of the envelope, sort of a, a gut computation. You can do different stuff with geometric returns and stuff, but I just want folks to sort of have yeah. that big picture. And thanks, Brian. I think we've 
tied into that some of that in previous meetings and why we initially came with the, that new rec, uh, asset allocation when looking at your portfolio, even all the way back in January, in saying that you have a long time horizon, you have a certain return target, and if you're looking for that growth, you know, as far as increasing your private equity from 5% to 10%, that's where we were, um, you know, away from hedge funds. And then on the, the real estate side, we really think of that more as, at least on the core side, as a diversifier, since a lot of that comes from income. And so we think of core real estate being sourced from, from fixed income, but also good benefits of diversification there. And that's why we're not getting into it tonight, but you know, increasing private real estate from 5% to 10% as well. So thanks for that comment, Brian. Um, before turning it over to, to Ariel, I think what I'll just set up, um, just to again, give Vanguard's approach and thoughts on, on private equity, uh, different factors. So why did, why did Vanguard move into this? You know, from a philosophical standpoint, from an investment perspective, in believing in starting with the global market cap or total global market cap, is you're missing a segment of investing if you don't include private equity. So we realized that was a segment that our primarily our institutional investors, because this private equity offer is only open to our OCIO clients, so that there was a segment of the market that we were missing. So that's an overall private equity makes up anywhere between 10, 15 percent of the global market cap. And this is on page 18. You could you could see some of this as far as the left hand side, how many publicly traded companies there are versus private. So that's the first part. Second is historically there's been an illiquidity premium. Even illiquidity premiums work in such as small cap stocks. Um, historically, that's been around 3%. We don't necessarily think it would be that high going forward given all of the entrance into the private equity, but still believe that there will be an illiquidity component. And then the third part, and this is where we're spending our time, is the access, the access to top quartile managers, which is so important. And we think that our scale has given us great access to a partner like HarborVest, but then more importantly, also part of the Vanguard philosophy is keeping that cost low. And the cost that we are offering this solution to is none of our institutional investors can get that pricing on their own. So HarborVest pricing is lower given uh, Vanguard scale. Um, and with that, I think maybe on page 18, I'll turn it to Ariel, or again, take your questions on any of those comments. Thanks, Brian. Okay. So I'm happy to take you first to the, and please interrupt me at any time with questions. I'm happy to, to, to share any insights here. As by way of introduction, I work on the product team, um, looking at private equity. My my background prior to coming to Vanguard was in the endowment and foundation space covering PE managers. Um, so I can direct you to talk a little bit more about HarborVest. I know we sent in advance the private placement memorandum regarding the product. And I think on, on page 19, I can, I'm happy to give you an overview of HarborVest. Um, I can talk a little bit about the product itself and the diversification we've put into it. Um, their performance and fee structure, but please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So I'm looking at page 19, and this gives a high-level overview of HarborVest. Do um, so you understand the manager that is partnering with Vanguard for private equity? And I think to, to give you some background on HarborVest, so they're a long-standing, really experienced manager with a 35-plus year history. They're only in private markets and they manage around $68 billion in AUM. So they've been around, as I mentioned, for 35-plus years. They're privately owned. And a lot of what we found really compelling in this partnership, even at the outset, is how fully dedicated they are exclusively to investing in private markets. It's all they do. They're not a hedge fund manager. They don't invest in public. So all of the expertise of their 600 professional firm goes to private market opportunities. And they have 
10 offices globally. They have 125 dedicated investment professionals dedicated to finding these unique opportunities in private markets. And so if I just could you know, direct you to two numbers on this page that I think are the most salient to the Vanguard team in starting this partnership, as Brian mentioned earlier this year when it was announced, we were really impressed by the, the bottom two on either side boxes, the 700 plus advisory board seats. It, it was a really incredibly powerful figure for us in selecting HarborVest. It's usually, you know, for those who have familiarity, the advisory board for uh, for private equity funds, it's a really small group of LPs, uh, the investors who are selected to be advisors to the fund. They provide guidance and insight in the fund, but there's also a lot of information shared with HarborVest. It's incredibly non-public, incredibly specific to these small committees, and, and over 77% of their funds um, they have advisory board access. So this is a really powerful figure. We also know that if you look at the other bottom half of the screen, 950 plus managers tracked information, especially relationship wide information is really critical in this business for them having a really data driven and incredibly strong Rolodex of names and managers that they're constantly tracking and providing value for gives them this preferential access top quartile managers, which Brian talked about at the outset, is so critical to getting performance given high dispersion in private equity. You have to have access to those top managers and their longstanding relationships allow them to do so. So a lot of those attributes of HarborVest made them incredibly appealing as a partner. And so with Vanguard, if, if you move to page 20, we've designed the HarborVest Vanguard 2020 Fund, which is what a lot of the information you've got background on, um, and what the, the focus of today's conversation will be about. So the, the, you can see on the, on the page, there's a allocation target. You can see our intended strong diversification for this fund across stage, strategy, and geography. And so when an investor commits to the product, they're having a exposure to a comprehensive investment solution, a somewhat turnkey that gives you within the product a ton of diversification across vintage year, across stage strategy, across different parts of the developed world. So I can point you here, I can walk you through the allocation target. Um, you can see that most of the fund is committed geographically to the most proven PE markets, so that's North America and Europe. In terms of strategy, most of the fund is primary, it's about 60% of the fund, and that's to drive long-term performance and actually create really targeted stage exposure. And then the fund also provides diversification across all three stages. So buyouts, primarily a large part of this, there's growth equity and venture, and then special situations. Think about an opportunistic or, or companies in a turnaround phase. Now, so that's the broad diversification that this fund has, which is incredibly intentional on the part of Vanguard in designing this with HarborVest. What I do want to make sure that this um, group is aware of, however, is, that, is the bottom part of this page. Any private equity fund, it has a long lockup period. Um, that's implicit in, in the asset class, and I'm sure you all are familiar with the other investments that I saw that the um, town holds, but this term is 14 years. So I just wanted to make call that out and make that explicit for this product. Um, and the investment period is the first three years. So HarborVest starts to deploy capital in the first three years. They're investing in different GPs. It'll be 30 to 40 in the primary space over those three years. So you're getting embedded vintage year diversification. So I wanted to call those out. That's the broad overview of the fund, and I can start to dive into those different parts. I just high-level outlined of what you're, of what we intentionally wanted to make sure you're getting in terms of diversification. But I'll pause there for a minute for questions. Yeah, and I also um, just ask the committee if, if we're, you know, if we're using any terms, keep us honest, like GP, you know, general partner, LP, limited partner, you know. Call us out on any alphabet soup to make sure uh, everyone understands it. 
to appreciate that, Brian, very much so. I think if we, you know, what can help even elucidate even more some of the, the high level diversification we're bringing with this product is if you look on page 21, we've really tried to outline the primary, secondary, and direct co-investment that this product has embedded within it. And, and I think Brian's point is a good one, so please do stop me if I'm getting into the lingo of this space, but I think what can help explain it is just even giving some examples. So this, this fund has primary, secondaries, and direct. The primaries in this product are think about commitments to new funds at their initial formation date. So you're gonna get you know, a Bessemer fund, an Excel partners, or a Blackstone fund. This is a starting up. And, and HarborVest, by investing in primaries, this is the largest portion of the fund. They can target stage, they can target geography, they can target strategy by investing intentionally in this pipeline of primary investments. Think about your typical PE investment. And what I think makes this somewhat unique, and when we were, were making sure that um, our partner would have strong capabilities, are these other two areas, which are the secondary and direct co-investment. So HarborVest has a lot of relationships in the primary space, but secondary investments, which are also uh, a part of this portfolio, are and generally they're investments in a portfolio that can generate liquidity pretty quickly after the initial purchase. So think about, you know, in the traditional sense, like an LP, an investor, a university, who is, uh, cannot, can no longer, for whatever reason, they're, they've changed over their committee or they have dramatically, they have a new chief investment officer and they want to change their strategy dramatically, if they had to sell their positions in private equity, HarborVest is doing the due diligence to be the buyer at a discount of those interests that are actually more in their distribution phase. You're getting capital a lot quicker. And the direct co-investment, which is this final piece of the fund, are when it's an example of when HarborVest is investing directly into a company and doing the due diligence to um, invest in that company outside of a traditional private equity structure. They are not paying a fee or any carried interest, and they're getting capital to work fairly quick, quickly with no fee drag. And, and before I pause, just on page 22, what you can see is how these different investment strategies have varying cash flow profiles. So I know Brian included for this, um, for this meeting a number of graphs showing uh, you know, how um, the town may start to commit to the HarborVest product for years if you would cho choose to do so. And, and what this slide shows is that actually secondaries are driving distributions in the first five years. Primaries are driving distributions over the next five years. And the co-investments are really driving distributions throughout the time period in, and largely into the later part of the fund. And that blends to give a diversified cash flow profile in addition to a cross stage in geography. And so that um, you know, you're, you're getting distributions earlier in the fund life and it mitigates the typical J curve that you would experience in a typical primary private equity fund. So I can, I can turn next to the performance, but I, I do wanna make sure I'm, I'm stopping for any questions on, on kind of the yeah. overall structure and how we yeah. compile this portfolio. Could I ask a question? Sure. Oh, okay, this is Ken. First of all, can you guys hear me? I think I've screwed up the uh, <laughs> video audio thing. I can hear you fine. If, hear if this you is fine. the first time I can hear you. Oh, okay. So could Ariel just step back for a second and discuss with the group the 14-year uh, illiquid lockup? nature of this investment because I, I i think i think it's important that our board really understands what we're getting it's we're getting into here um that's that's a very yeah. very long time to be locking up our money um so so maybe you could just talk about that yeah happy to do so and i think it can be 
you know, we can get to these cash flow slides in a bit that look like hill diagrams later in the presentation, but I do appreciate that. So the, the term is a 14 year term. And so what that means is that the, you know, the investment period is in the first three years of that 14 years, but the very last dollar received back to the investor comes back in a tail form by year 14. And so what that actually looks like, and we've done a lot of modeling, is that you start to receive some capital back. So let's say you commit your you know, initial commitment amount this year. You start to receive distributions actually starting in the, in that, in the following year because of the distributive cash flow profile, the diversified cash flow profile where we have secondaries and co-invest. And you'll actually start to turn net positive in cash flow, and we've modeled this out, between years four and five. So you are getting, uh, so the, the, the cash flow, you know, cap calls that you're getting each year will exceed distributions up until around year four when you start receiving capital back that outweighs any capital call. And you'll likely get the full commitment amount back um, largely around, it can be a little bit before year seven. And so then what happens is, to the great point, it, this is a 14-year life. You're starting to get your full commitment about commitment back well in advance of that 14 years, but additional capital that would come back to you in the form of net profit is going to continue to come back over the later years of the fund, year seven plus, um, until your last penny comes back, year 14. So it should not be understated that this is a lockup. Uh, right, but... So here's a question, uh, but we're still exposed to the risk of the strategy one way or another for 14 years. Obviously, there's different levels of risk uh, based on what the capital outlay and comeback is, I guess you call it. Uh, but, but, the, but, but as a board, I, unless I'm not understanding it, we're making a very long-term commitment in terms of the risk. Is that a fair way to look at it? Yeah, and I'll, I'll I jump in with one comment is, and if you define, yeah. define risk and illiquidity, absolutely can, long lockup of, of capital. You've probably seen that with your Mesero and your Lexington. So a risk from illiquidity, absolutely. Um, in thinking of the total portfolio and keeping that in mind, right? is that the other 90% or 80, however you want to define it, is going to be very liquid, right? The Vanguard mutual funds, mm -hmm. the alley liquidity will never have an issue, you know, paying, paying for payments. Even the private real estate, though it's private, there's quarterly liquidity. Uh, so I'll say you have to be comfortable with that long time period. There are probably some board members that won't be here in 10 years to see the realization of those returns, um, but thinking about the 90 other percent of the portfolio that is pretty liquid to meet any kind of redemptions, uh, benefit payments, or changes in asset allocation. And if I could just follow up with with a actually a, a unrelated question, uh, uh, well related to private equity. Um, one thing I'm a little, I, I really was thinking about this afternoon as we're getting ready for this meeting is that in a way it's interesting the way you guys are recommending this product because um, in the public space, you guys acknowledge and uh, you still hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so you guys, so you guys do a great job. Uh, 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 selling what I, I've talked about for years, which is that obviously uh, uh, it's very hard next to impossible for public fund managers to outperform indexes. And therefore you're recommending the indexes and for the 80% of the fund, we did that and you know, that's great. But then in the private equity space, you're also acknowledging that most of the um, performers are no good, so to speak. And yet you're arguing that you guys can pick some winner in this space when you say you can't do it in 
the entire other market. And it, it really just doesn't make sense to me to tell you the truth. Yeah. So it, um, it's true. Like on the, I'll stay on the public side for, I think those are all fair comments on the public side. You know, we do have actively managed funds and the biggest headwind to outperformance is cost. And because it's a zero sum game. And so even with our active equity products, uh, you know, it's the cost advantage as well as access to top tier managers that we think of is how are you going to outperform in the public spaces? You have to have access to great talent. You have to be patient and you have to have lo um, low cost. And so there's the same components, but to the private equity side. So we have to be patient here because it's a liquid. Two is you have to have access to talent, which we think we have on the private equity side too. And then also the costs. So costs are much higher than publics, of course, um, but we've tried to keep that cost low and based on all the research and confirmation from HarborVest is that the cost of this private equity fund will be lower than other private equity or, or comparable products out, out in the market. Um, so I think you're right. And then it comes back to that other chart, Ken, is that disparity between top and bottom performance managers that is much wider. Um, so yes, we think we have a, a good or a great partner with HarborVest, but we will never be able to confirm that hey, we'll guarantee you know, returns or outperformance. No, uh, yes. uh, of course. And, right. uh, and I appreciate that you wouldn't say that. Yeah. And and I assume Ariel's going to get to the costs, so I'll I'll let her continue. But I do want to talk about that in more detail because my peeking ahead here, it looks like it's pretty darn expensive. Uh, I don't I don't see how these managers can overcome those costs, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. This is what we want to have much more of a dialogue than just talking to uh, slides. Yeah. Absolutely. And Appreciate that as well. I, I think I would echo Brian's comments both on the dispersion space and in the public markets where we find there's additional ability to generate alpha just from the nature of non-public information and um, from the from the aspect of persistence that we've seen increase in this space relative to public. But I very much appreciate the, the dialogue. I think I don't want to stop the conversation. If you would like to cut to fees, I'm happy to just take a minute to talk through those and then can can talk through the performance as well that we've that we've included in the deck. No, no, you, you go ahead with your with your presentation. Okay. I just had a quick question on the on the um the tenor. So it's a 14 year final. Exactly a 14 year fund term. That's right. So, in extensions? There is a possibility for extension. And that could be in a one year. So, there's a possibility you'll see in the documents that um, there's a possibility for three one year extensions if needed. That's correct. Wow. So, not a, not a 10 with, with three one year extensions, but. Uh, a 14. Well, I, mean, that's a, I mean, it's not a venture capital fund. That is a very long traditional primary and secondary, you know, growth, LBO, you know, whatever your mix is. That's, that's a really long window. Yeah, a lot of the um, situation here kind of thing is first of all to match that vintage year diversification where they have a three year long investment period. So their intention is to then, you know, it's the 2020 fund, they have a pipeline, but they're starting to make those commitments over those three years and they all have their independent fund lives that then extend. So I, I hear that. I think that's a fair point. Um, the extensions that, that can be made are, by the way, in partnership with Vanguard and HarborVest. And so, Kind of the unique relationship that we have in having this partnership is there is a fair amount of stewardship and governance and oversight that ensures that there isn't a long time extension for reasons that aren't clear 
largely being that it's over some kind of a disruptionary period, which we're not in right now. And their fee structure over the um, beyond the uh, 36, you said it was a 36 month open window? Yeah, so the, the fee structure, um, I'm actually just happy to cut to that. On, on 25, I think that's a, I'm glad you asked that. You're asking me in terms of the structure of the fees overall. Is, is that what I heard? I'm happy to walk through that right now. If I, uh, if I turn to page 25. So yeah, I want to know whether they, um, you know, they're charging a, a full freight um, for the investment window and the entire, you know, uh, four, you know, 14 year investment window or if they tail off based on, um, you know, some folks start to slash the management fee after um, the investment window is done. Yep. So thank you. That's great. Thank you for clarifying the question. At the um, underlying GP level, so imagine the primaries in this and obviously the secondaries and no fees on the co-invest, the expectation is broadly investors will have step downs, or pardon me, those, those managers will have step downs in their fees after their investment period. But when HarborVest is collecting at the committed level, they're co collecting on committed capital, it maintains at that 21 basis point, which is the fee for this product throughout the life, the 14 years, exactly. And I'm sorry, is there, is there a hurdle that's involved here or um, of yeah, any sort? Um, absolutely, so on page 26, I can even go a little bit more into depth. There is a hurdle. So if I if I if I can direct your attention to page 26 to the bottom left uh, uh, box. So um, the access fees, you'll see an underlying GP line and an access fees line. The underlying GP line summarizes the likely fees for the underlying GPs in the product. The access fees highlight both Vanguard and Harbor Vest fees in this product. So to answer your question on the hurdle, for Harbor Vest, they have a hurdle of 8% um, for their co-invest and secondary strategies where they're collecting carry. Harbor Vest does not collect any carried interest on their primaries, which are the majority of the funds. Did everyone get that? It, it was, I was getting a little bit hard to hear on my end. Absolutely, I can repeat that. Does it sound a little bit better? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you for the question on hurdles. I'm on page 26. The hurdle rate, and, I, and I'm outlining the two lines of underlying GPs and access fees on the bottom left, and I'm, I'm Zooming in on the, there's underlying GPs that are assumed for the product and the access fees to get access to this are the 31 basis points and 5% carry. The carried interest is over an 8% hurdle rate for the secondaries and co-investments. And the primaries, which are the broadest, largest part of this fund, there is no carry on that portion. So 21 basis points, which is what Harbor Vest is charging, and their um, carried interest, where they're not collecting anything on primaries, and that um, over that 8% hurdle for secondaries and co-investments, where they are collecting carry over that hurdle, was the lowest fees we were able to find for a product like this. So the, the rest of the slide does show some comparables for investing directly in GPs or finding a similar product. And we were not able to find in a lot of our industry research anything comparable to that level. Does everybody understand? Can you understand that? Well, it's funny. It's funny you asked that, Brian. Uh, <laughs> my, what I was going to do was raise an interesting and not hopefully not controversial comment, which was one of my biggest um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, criticisms of the Allianz situation was I didn't think the group understood what we were getting into. And I am very confident that the group as a whole does not understand this because I, I barely understand it. Yeah, I, I do. Um, I'm just trying to figure out a way to, uh, so, so, from, so for context, you know, two and 20 is a pretty, um, it's bandied about. Um, so if we, uh, in, in, in Lexington, so we're in Lexington. So, I mean, so that's why, I mean, I was asking the folks understand that because, you know, in Lexington, we are paying, um, darn near, uh, two and 20, um, certainly blended in the three funds that I think we're still in. It's at least two, it might, might be three. Um, and that means, you know, we're paying the management fee, which everybody sort of understands, but that's the, um, except management fee here is for what we've committed. So it's not mm -hmm. what they've actually exactly. asked from us. It's so if we said, Hey, we're going to put, uh, we're usually somewhere in the five to $10 million bite right. size. So we, we actually pay, uh, once they start, once they do their first close, mm -hmm. um, and start doing their investment activities, we, we begin to be cha uh, charged, uh, on a pro rata basis, along with all the other, um, but we get charged about roughly 2%, uh, and, and, and Lexington, I believe is 10. I think the ones we're in are 10 with three, one year extensions. So as far as how long, so we are in long products uh, already. Um, and those are mostly secondary funds. So they're buying into a mix of seasoned product. Um, and then, um, I don't remember that there's there are hurdles in Lexington, but the, when I asked, but there's a hurdle, a hurdle means, so when you see this carry like, Oh, well, what is carry? Well, it's in it's straight up form. I'm going to say two and 20, the 20 is carry and it in a, in like in a hedge fund, that means that any, anything that they earn above zero, they're taking a fifth of it home. Um, if you ask for a hurdle, uh, there are different types of hurdles, European and American style, but um, I think the Europeans have it right in that basically it means after their investors have truly received a targeted return, whether it's 8% or 5% or whatever the number is, only then does the manager get to take, in this case, um, well, this graphic is a little bit misleading because of the whole, there's a hurdle embedded in whether or not they get, they, before they get their carry, but they're not going to get this 17% uh, or 5 in the first column, the 5%, they're not going to get it unless they've are, you've already received a baseline return. And some, some reasons that's a good thing, like for a pension fund or, a, or endowment or foundation or ENF where they have very specific returns they're trying to hit is that if things go swimmingly, right. And they, they do these good investments, um, they're, they're kind of, their, their baseline is kind of getting, you know, we're at a 7% target, right? So if the baseline, if the hurdle is eight, right. We're like, well, I'm getting eight and yeah, I'm sharing a heck of a lot of the profits, you know, a fifth roughly above that. But, you know, you, you take that with a grain of salt. If you're hitting like an eight percent return over a you know a f five to ten year period, you know, sort of like an IRR sort of basis, then I would say that that's you know in, in this day and age for a long period that should pretty be pretty happy. Now you gave up a lot of liquidity to get that, but um, but if you're getting that sort of return, compass, it's a great return over a, you know a decade. Um, and do you want to pay for it? And do you want to pay, you know, some will say it's dearly, but, um, that's the, the crux. And the other goofy thing is like the hurdle and whether or not the 2% of management fee and how that all gets calculated. I mean, if it's done correctly, it should be, your hurdle should be like actual, what comes back and hits you. So the, the management fee should have been accounted for because you're getting hit that management fee on a regular basis. And it's, um, I like to think of management fees as money that never gets invested, 
ne never never even sees a potential project. So it's quite a drag to overcome. Right. If you think about that's it, an that's, excellent point. Right. Well, if you think about it, if you're like, oh, I, I invested 10 million bucks, and you're like, well, <laughs> you know, each year, like 2% is just coming out and it's, it's never, never going to get put to work. So if you think of it as a manager, it's quite a, it's quite a, um, they do it, right? They've managed it. They got some track record, but it, you think about it, you're like, holy cow, 2% per annum. And you can just sort of stack that money up off to the side and say, what did I really invest? You know, maybe I only invested you know, a little over 8 million and even put 10 million to work, but I still have to get my hurdle rate on the 10, like the 10 million committed. So it's a, um, yeah, they have to do what? Brian? Yeah. Can I, can I interrupt? I ask, you, ask you and the other Brian and Ariel a couple of questions um, on this topic. So, so something that worries me a lot is that, and this is, what ended up happening with Allianz or, or any hedge fund or alternative investment is that this hurdle thing sounds like it's a good thing for the investor. We've talked about this before, mm -hmm. but in reality, I think it's a disaster for the investor because, and especially if you're locking up for 14 years. So if, if in the first couple of years, the fund does poorly, Let's just say the markets suck, right? So it's nobody's fault, but the fund does poorly. And now you have this huge hurdle. Why would the guys who are working there stay working on that fund? Because they have no chance of making any incentive bonuses and all that stuff. And that's exactly I, I, what happened with Allianz. That's, that's a good, well, that's a good question. They, but they, I, they, you're, they you're, all jump I'll, ship. Right, Allianz and is more like a hedge fund structure. So the, the difference you get here is when you uh, underperform and you have a high watermark. So now you're talking to a high watermark versus like a like a strict European or American hurdle that we're talking about. The difference is, is like it becomes a di downward spiral and 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 hopelessness potentially in a hedge fund. Whereas a private equity. Remember, they're collecting these management fees on committed capital, not invested. So I can tell you that it's pretty, it's a pretty darn good gig, mm -hmm. certainly for something like Harbor Vest, right? They've got, even at 1%, you look at the, what is it? 65 bill. I forget. Yeah, it's massive. They've got a, a, yeah, from a business perspective, a cash flow stream that they don't really have to worry a whole lot about making sure that the food gets put on the table. Now, certainly everybody, um, likes the incentive stuff, but I will tell you, look at these J curves and stuff that are, are written. And if you do a true, like a European hurdle, like a true hurdle. So sometimes when I say true and not true, hurdle, like American style, they'll do these things where on each, um, either do it on uh, different windows, but they say they, they hit it out of the home, hit a home run on some early investments, meaning they did something, they flipped it around really quick and they had a great IRR, right? Cause just time, right? Time value money, whatever they doubled their money, but they did it in two years. And then they take performance out of it. They're like, Oh, I was above the 8%. I'm taking some money, you know, putting it on the mattress. And then the next couple of years, like you said, something happens, the market has a cycle and it just blows. And you're like, well, wait a minute. They're not giving me that money back. <laughs> they took on this early. So, um, that's why we say like, uh, uh, they want to ensure over a, a true hurdle is like that you've the investors managed to maintain their their investment over the, the long horizon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about those is they're very back ended for the manager. So they right they're they're in it the long haul through a cycle. They want to see the returns because they're going the generally the payouts. If you look at the J curve and the returns, the payouts mm -hmm. are back end like five years, six years, seven. They're out there and they can be sizable. They can be very big, but they're back ended, which right because they stick around and they've got you know they're they're vested with. It. Now I now I'm not a private equity expert, so I may have said all sorts of stuff that's wrong, and I apologize. But um, I'm just trying to simplify. Yeah. So Ariel, well, 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 like the message I, I just made. Some of that was good stuff there. The the other thing that I'm concerned the board does not fully understand is because I'm just understanding it now is this issue of a J curve, meaning yeah. we are, if we commit 
let's just say five five percent of our fund is what uh, that's twenty odd million dollars. If we commit twenty million dollars into this thing, we're going to be paying full fees on or on twenty million dollars from day one, even mm -hmm. though we they may only call say two million of it in the first year and whatever and maybe after three or four years they've only called five or eight million or whatever i don't know the details but but this fee drag strikes me as is almost insurmountable i don't i don't i don't see how it, it, you know you'd think that but i've i've you know the good managers that they um that's why people keep money with them <laughs> it, it you know they do overcome it and um and I, it is a great question, and it's very hard. And you have to rely on your, uh, in my opinion, you have to rely on Callan in the past and now <laughs> Vanguard to because um, managers, uh, and and because Harbor Vest is like a manager of managers, it gets even a little bit more difficult. But you have to keep um, you have to keep a close eye on uh, management fees, uh, administration fees. Um, make sure there's no redirect of like, sometimes they set up side companies that are actually, you know, basically owned by the management team to, to do other services on some of the companies or investments. So they're getting fee income that way. So you, all those, and also how they're calculating the return, like, yeah. are they, are they, you know, you have to make sure the administrator is calculating the, the, the what the sub the subscriber subscription subscriber agreement says like thou shall earn as an LP, you know, you shall pay this. And, you know, these are how the fees are calculated because like you said, it can be very complicated and um, you got to make sure that the numbers are getting done correctly and then calculating what your true return is because you know, that's so, why you watch, you watch exactly. people do multiple of invested capital, which for some people that's, you know, they'll say, well, if I put, you just said what we're going to put 10, 10 million in or 20 million in. Yeah. So well, are we going to get, are we going to get 40 million back or 50 million back and, and over a 10 year period? And you say, well, is that, is that going to float your boat, Mr. Brockfeld? And you're like, well, let me think about it. You're saying I'm going to more than double my money over a 10 year period, right? Well, rule 72, you're like, oh, it's seven, at least a 7% return, right? So net of fees. So they they do it, but I mean I, I'm I'm speaking too much yeah. now. But I mean I'll let Vanguard. Let me, uh, I heard uh, three things in there, Ken. I want to make sure we get all to them. One was what's the incentive for these managers to hang around? So we want to address that. Two was just understanding the J curve, and we may be able to flip mm -hmm. to your actual performance of some of your existing private equity investments to see or to understand that, um, and then. Gosh, I just blanked on the, on the third one. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got I've got a couple too. I heard as well. I, I appreciate the discussion. Some were even in the in the parts of carry and terms that I also just want to make sure I can um, help yes. uh, shed light on. Th that you know, was one of which Ariel. being. I was just gonna. Yeah, this is that Ariel. Was, that was yeah. Just real quickly, that was one of Ken's too. Is like is that in the program, we wouldn't commit, we wouldn't build to that 10% 10, 10 allocation all at once in the first year. And we, we would stagger that in because we would want to invest in different vintages. When you talk about diversification, we talked about geography and types, but also as vintage, right? You're gonna get a different return if you're investing in a kind of a recession where we are now versus the peak of the market. So that that target is a longer term target and we wouldn't get there in 2020, even 2021. So that was the third one. Thanks, Ari, I'll let you uh, jump back into it. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there were a couple things I, I wanted to first just touch on the terms just because there were a couple that were thrown around and I think it's important to just help explain yeah. them. I hear very, strongly that the sensitivity and making sure that the group fully understands exactly how it's structured here. I think the first of which being the American versus European carry, we did negotiate something to be closer to the fund-friendly European carry structure. 
this is an LP friendly structure. I know I heard the discussion of, hey, a deal gets a really hot, they knock it out of the park and then another one has some kind of a loss. And then that would you know, mean that they still get their carry. That's not what's negotiated here. The carry is, the, the hurdle must be achieved by the entire strategy. So you would see you know, all of the secondary performance hitting their hurdle before anything is achieved in net profits and carry. So I just wanted to highlight that help friendly term on the, on the carry. Um, you're completely right on the hurdle as well. I heard that well. So when they have to hit 8%, in order for the net profits to then be split between Harbor Vest and Vanguard. And I did hear also on the um, on the fees, that kind of question also on the, the insurmountable above. We do, so Harbor Vest is collecting 21 basis points for the fund term. And that's, that's true that they are collecting that as the management fee. They have been able to historically against the, their, um, we have a slide in here on the PME benchmark, which shows their performance as though you had invested in the MSCI ACLE and you had funded and distributed um, in the same manner that their, that their funds were funded and distributed. And they were able to achieve at the lowest 490 basis points over the ACLE. And so, and at the, their median was, was 970 basis points when replicating their performance. So there is also just, I, I hear that point taken well on the fees on committed capital. And I also hear the, the, the counterpoint well on the ability to then achieve alpha that far overcomes that management fee drag. But I do hear that point. I think to, to Brian's point on the um, incentive, J curves, and then the target allocation. So we do have that uh, even more insight on the incentive there. So Harbor Vest, does have this product, we were able to get a significant discount at 21 basis points, significantly discounted to the other products they offer for other investors. So if our investors in, at Vanguard um, were to leave Vanguard for some reason and go to HarborVest on their own, they would experience fees at almost three times of what we were able to secure. Um, so, so there is some level of, at the carry level, we are incentive aligned across the enterprise. So, you know, Vanguard is getting a pro rata allocation of every investment. The teams are working, are all the same teams across the HarborVest platform, and they're getting to those hurdles for every product they oversee. But I just did want to make clear that the, the, the management fee is negotiated for Vanguard, but the carried interest aligns incentive at the long term that they're achieving their net profits across each strategy, and that's what their compensation is tied to across the enterprise, a not just at Vanguard. A Ariel, could I just uh, interrupt with a quick yeah. question? It's Ken sure. again. What is, maybe I'm a little confused, what is Vanguard's um, Page. economics on this, this product? Page yeah, 20. so we, for the, Sure. So Harbor Vest is getting 21 basis points. Vanguard mm -hmm. gets 10 basis points. And that's page 26, Ken, in the committee. Okay. So on the left hand side, again, you see you know, fees to the underlying general partners. Those are the Excel, the black stones, the black rocks. You know, those are the, the, yeah. the general partners. Then you see the access fees of 31 basis points. And that's that's the split that Ariel talked about. And, and how about the how about the carry? We don't receive any carry. Okay. And for the product, yep. And I, I want I'm going to even go a step further, just so just so you all know, like there's no incentive uh, for me or for Ariel, others. Like we want to spend as much time with you on this to understand it. I mean, you're already invested in private equity, and I. I think it's very beneficial hearing some of your experiences on returns and fees. Um, so while we were, you know, recommending this in terms of asset allocation, I also want you to feel and know there's no incentive besides the Harbor Vest fees for Ariel or me or anyone in Vanguard to, you know, quote unquote, sell this product to, to clients. So can I, um, you, you know, to me, this has been, 
Thanks, Carolyn. It's been it's been really helpful to hear all of this, but I think um, you know we are we are pretty much at our allocation in private equity already. Right. Right. Um, we don't even know what type of penalties or exit fees we would be clipped with if we made a change, right? I mean, I don't feel like, I don't feel, not only do I not feel comfortable enough in understanding what? the harbor vest, I don't feel, I would like, there's a whole lot more information I feel like we need to kind we, of know and understand. Sure. This, this was to talk about this platform. So the fact that we're doubling our private equity exposure this would be where the new money would go. Yeah. So we're, like, we're not touching yeah. Mesero or Lexington. They're they're gonna roll off like that graph that Ariel showed. I mean, thank you. A little yeah. shorter, um, but we're getting cash in. I mean, we didn't go in the latest Lexington or Mesero offerings, which uh, one of them because timing was bad, and the other one because the fees were kind of high, and that's actually good because that means we we'll get capital back earlier. But um, right. We we yeah. we know we no way we're selling. You know, we'd get crushed if we were to get out of our existing. It wouldn't be a fee. We'd have to sell our position in a secondary market, and because we're so tiny, we would take a bath. And we there's no by me no means we would ever recommend selling any of your existing investments for that reason. And that's why there's some some slides on 27 and 28 where we can model out what distributions are expected and capital calls to see how you build to that allocation. And I just had one other industry question like real yeah. quick on that page 26 again. Um, I know, you know, when you have like the industry standard and the 17% and the, um, is that industry standard more for a fund to fund vehicle? So you, you're the Jeep, the uh, traditional GPs or the managers are cutting their 20% carry because a chunk of it's going to these large, I know Harbor Vest is obviously a large fund to fund. So there's some sort of a, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sort of surprised. Like, I mean, um, when we went go direct with Lexington, obviously uh, we're, we're never going to get a discount, but it's 20%. But are you saying that like maybe we, if we were just a little bit bigger, we could be getting a haircut on the um, traditional two and 20, but I'm just focusing on the 20 because of that, that graphic. Remember a lot of it says 17. Yeah, so the, the idea here for that center section, I know your question is on the carry. Basically, we're, we're assuming that you could achieve something with the same blend of primary, secondary, and co-invest. The assumptions are at the top of the page. And you're assuming you could get that blend, which blends down to a 17% carry. So instead of your typical two and 20 that you would get from like a bunch of primary funds in this product, we're saying, hey, let's be conservative. Suppose you can also get primary, secondaries, and co-investments at some level of discounted fees and carry. Co-invest don't have any carry. Secondaries, they're, they're late in the investment period, so they're cheaper. And so we're assuming that if you can achieve all of that, you would have an, the underlying GP fee a little bit lower than 2 and 20 because of the strategy diversification. And then the access fees would be, again, an assumption that you can get maybe a similar product. It wouldn't be at our 21 basis points, but it would likely be maybe you could get at 85 basis points, and that sums to a higher number. Does that make sense? So, so the idea is these are all assumed numbers in the second in the second chart, assumed based on industry of what we found other comparable products to look like on the access fees row, and assumed based on a diversified strategy portfolio that takes those three numbers at the top and blends them into the management fee and carry you're seeing on the underlying GPs row. Got it. Well, I mean, I can just say that the management, the management fee it definitely is a low number for private equity, especially with access on top of it. Um, so yeah, that that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, and I do want to. I think you asked it. There was a a great comment there earlier, just on the on the allocation and making sure you can uh, not sell your existing Lexington Mesro. 
the the what I want to highlight in some of the graphs and showing the the cash flows is that if you don't because of the those investments selling down, um, you know of course we want you to be comfortable with the decision, but as part of that private equity allocation, you do have to have some kind of continued funding or the private equity allocation draws down. So it may not be you know in the amount Brian had talked through the asset allocation of having a 10% to private equity, but even maintaining the 5% does require, because those, those funds have a drawdown rate, continued commitment. So we just wanted to highlight that. I think you can see it on page 28, how the, the, there are solid bars and then the kind of lined bars that are a little lighter in color start to draw down, and that's your existing investment. Yeah, for the, for the board, um, well, I know Eric has been around, but I mean, we did a, we had to do a model to figure out how long it would take for us to get to our 5% private equity allocation. So it took, yeah. I don't want to say it took like five and a half or six years to get to where we are now. We're obviously now fully funded, but yes, in order to stay fully funded, you have to, can, you know, pick a new manager or an existing manager and continue to buy in to maintain that 5% exposure, but we, for a long time, you know, I went to the board of finance and explained, you know, they're like, why are you underweight private equity? I'm like, well, we're not technically, I mean, we're, you know, we're funding it as we get there and we're like two and a half percent or 3%. So it's only been uh, very recently that we've actually gotten to that critical mass. And now if we were to go to 10, well, like Ariel said, or Brian said, you know, it's not like you're just going to dump it all in one vintage, you're going to ladder in and get like vintage exposure. And, you know, it would take, it would take years to get to that full um, percentage exposure. Yeah. That, that illustration is on page 27. Um, so thank you for all that is, is that, yeah, if we make no more investments, the committee makes no more investments in private equity. That's your, that's a gray bar, you know, gray shading on 27 is, you know, you're just going to start getting distributions. Um, and then your allocation will continue to, to drift down. You see that goes all the way out to 2028. And the building part is, is doing these annual vintages and building up to that 10%, which is saying in about, you know, three or four years. And that could always be, that could always be varied as far as how much it is in each, in each vintage. That's a very pretty graph. <laughs> Nice rainbow. <laughs> you, can, you can see some of that in your actual performance, right? I mean, I, I'm not privy to all those investments. I have, we haven't looked into them, but if you went all the way back to you know page eight, and if you looked at the returns of your private equity funds, you know there are different returns, and why is that? You know, some are getting distributions, and some are are still building up. You know, I think you're still getting capital calls for them, and that. That therein, and we can explain it more, is, is that J-curve. The J-curve is, in the beginning, you're just paying in and getting no returns until those private equity companies start, you know, going public or getting bought out. And uh, you could see that some of the performance of your existing private equity managers. Hey, Brian, Eric Caliper here. Just a quick question. Yes. So, I'm looking at a chart, not on your slide, but another slide, and... The, the amount of U.S. private equity dry powder has doubled since 2010 from, you know, a half a trillion to 1.2 trillion. Is that, right. is that a cause for concern by the committee? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm going to speak high level and then also to Ariel. Is, is I, I think anytime there's more money into any asset class, you expect that compression. And so that that goes with our thoughts of the return assumptions over public equities over a long period of time. Um, one is that liquidity premium historic illiquidity premium historically has been three. You know, I think that would come down. And then also the returns over public equities, I think, would be more compressed as well. So, I, I mean, yeah, hard to deny that more money going into any asset class wouldn't put pressure. Uh, on returns, and that that I think ties into you, your partner and in private equity of of that more persistence. I've already said enough. I'll turn it to Ariel. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's also, so we've been monitoring this pretty closely in terms of our looking at our entry into private equity. A lot of that has been concentrated in some of the mega funds. So I think it's like, I have to look at the stat, but it's something like two thirds of the last uh, like largest amount of dry powder raised was all in the top, think of the top four mega PE buyout funds. And it's a space where Harborvest doesn't play. So we were really intentional in looking at a partner to ensure that we weren't looking at the too much capital chasing too few deals part of the market that contributed to that huge two trillion in dry powder. Um, so we, we did look intentionally at Harborvest. They have 80% of their um, pipeline deals and previous investments in the past three years in small to mid-market buyouts where there is still opportunity, not as much in the largest space where they're looking for really big deals to satisfy their funds. But very much appreciate the question there. And I, uh, I thought that was a great point by, by Brian to point to page eight. Um, luckily, I, I did guess right. We are still in three Lexington funds. But if um, contextually, when people are talking about is it worth it or you getting paid, granted, past performance is no predictor of future. But if you look at um, the 10-year side, we just have the uh, Lex 2 that we were in at you know, roughly 15% return. Um, you can flip up to see what the public markets did over that same span. And it's about, you know, um, I think it's uh, roughly 13, right? So the Russell 3000 and the right. Russell 1000. So, you know, you got 200 basis points for, for giving up all liquidity. And if you go into the 10 year sort of span where we have the Mesero and uh, Lex 3 and and Lex 2, uh, again, you're, you know, somewhere 15, 16%, even Mesero, which is um, got a layer because it's got a fund, you know, there's additional fees in that structure, um, but they're at 11% and you go back up and look at where the public markets were. And, you know, they're all riding around nine, you know, nine and a half, 9.17 for the Russell 1000 to 3000. So you're like, well, even in Mesero, you picked up 200 basis points and in the Lex ones, you're picking up you know, 500. So, which is what, you know, you want, you want, I think, you know, a little proxy. Yeah. We use what three per 3%, right? So do we want 300 basis points for giving up all that liquidity? Um, which I don't know where we came up with that, but sounds good to me. But I mean, um, so that's why we, well, that's why we got into it. And luckily those seem to be panning out. Um, and that's, you know, why uh, Vanguard jumped in with Harbor Vest and they're proposing it to us today. Yeah, again, it's, it's thanks for sharing the committee's experience with private equity so far. And, you know, we never talked about, you know, where you were heading, you know, pre Vanguard with that allocation. Was it an intention to increase it? Uh, was it an intention to let it run off? And so, you know, thanks for sharing your collectively your your thoughts on how that allocation has worked after work for you. Yeah, well, I can just say that we had the concerns that Eric Calper just brought up that there's a lot of um, a lot of powder. Uh, your own graphs show massive redistribution from public to private. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. you, when you see the herd doing all that sort of stuff. <laughs> It's not going to end well. Um, and, uh, you know, I was concerned from a cyclical basis because not only is there manager dispersion, but right, your vintage exposure. I mean, if it's if it's a bad, you know, if you go into a cycle and you you invest with a manager going into that cycle, it, it's just not going to, you know, they, they might outperform relative to other managers in that cycle, but it's still going to stink. And I think as a board, even though we're, we were pretty much strategic and tactical. I think there's a lot of, right. you know, angst about, geez, you know, we've got a couple of double whammies here. You know, we've got a, this cycle's got to end. There's just tons of money flying in here. And, and Lexington, one of the things that shot them is, but they also came and it was higher fees. <laughs> like, 
like, okay, maybe, maybe we just take a breather here. And then, so it was whatever, a little lucky, I guess. So it's a good point on, I'm glad you're sharing that, you know, the fees that you're seeing with your existing managers are, are higher than what you here in Harbor Vast. And then maybe there is a point on where you are in the cycle and that perhaps could be spoken to page, you know, 23 or 24, depending on if you compare it to what index, but how Harbor Vest did or how private equity does in, in, in these, we'll call it recessionary environments. And sometimes they get some of their best returns. And then lastly, um, I'll just say, keep us honest as far as time. Of course, we love talking about this, but uh, you know, keep us honest there as well. No, I think it's important. It's good. And I, we haven't really done a ton of private equity overall. Just, I mean, it's been a while. I mean, Lexington, I forget when Lexington came in, but the last time we really spent a ton of time on that. And um, I think we have new members. So this whole concept of secondaries versus primaries and right. fees, it's all probably new for a fair amount of people. And I don't think we've ever talked about co-investment, which we, I guess we get some exposure to here, which is um, certainly a new phenomenon for small small folks like us. But um, the other thing, when, when we say we're worried about cycles and stuff and where we are, and with the traditional, like the way we were with going with a manager, and you're just pretty much like, okay, they're going to be putting money to work over the next two to four years. And if, you know, they, they, put some money, you know, smack dab to work in this next year, and all of a sudden the world turns, um, that's just going to stink. Um, I, I, I think, uh, and it was on the pretty graph, the way that the Harbor Vest Vanguard thing with them, um, there's going to be, vintage, you're going to get vintage years. Like yeah. you, it's so big that you'll be able to get, you know, you can get exposure every single year. Whereas with Lexington, right, we're going to be waiting if it's a three-year investment window, they're not going to be market. You know, you're, you got three years at least between when they're going to come visit you again. And so you don't get that annual, like Lexington's not doing annual slices, which you, you get here. So right. even though you may still get bit by the cycle, um, you know, you, you can spread it. You can actually limit it because you've got like 2020, 2021, 2022, which I think is a another good selling point from where I sit. Yeah, we think that's so important is being consistent uh, because that is a form of diversification is the year and what you invest. You know, if it's helpful at all, um, happy to spend any time on, on 23 and 24. That's maybe the, the one spot we didn't look at as closely in terms of performance. We do have vintage years to the point on cycles where you can see what the performance would have looked like for our product following recessionary periods. You know, they had done some projections even for, for this fund that, that come in the high teens returns in terms of net IRR and, and close to two in multiple. But we did include this for the very purpose of you being able to see what the outperformance would look like in t relative to the public market equivalent in this graph. And this is for both Acqui and S&P 500. So this is where you see what we were talking about. Brian, you know, we had talked about that great question on dry powder and, and compression in future state. We have built into our models and a lot of our expectations for what future portfolios look like 350 basis points above public markets of net outperformance, but their lowest outperformance in terms of our products model looks like 490 basis points. So it's just, it's valuable to understand, I think, the, the performance differential. And in a lot of the conversations, I, I can tell you because I've been in a lot of these for our, our endowment and foundation clients in the OCIO space, have been, you know, it, it harkens back to the first chart Brian showed, where he's sort of looking at comparables for allocations in terms of endowments, foundations, and, and pensions. And, and, and what you see is that investors are more and more interested in making sure that they can continue to achieve returns by at least having the, the at the low assumption points, that 350 basis points of alpha. So it's just helpful in um, 
um, just wanted to share it at the blended basis for this group for, for any questions you may have or just to you know, think through both the diversification but also what they've, what they've been able to achieve historically in the global financial crisis as well. Thanks. Well, I'll ask for your direction. I mean, maybe we can just give you an update and uh, see how we want to proceed. Mm -hmm. But on page, if we went back to page 20, uh, that talks about the, you know, the, this 2020 fund, you know, we're doing the first closing is August 14th of this year. And there's a second closing December 18th. So that's, that's where we are. You know, you can see the, the deadlines and the dates for, for this first 2020 fund. And, um, you know, and, and take you, your direction, Brian, and the committees on, you know, we want to talk about it more on the different meeting. You know, uh, we weren't planning on increasing private equity because of certain concerns around fees or liquidity. Um, but we're happy to talk about this at a future meeting. Uh, any or stay on and ask any more questions. Um, I mean, so uh, right now, well, you're basically saying that you know we have uh, like an August, somewhere between August and November, sort of a time frame to uh, to sign up and move stuff. And best you can tell, it's going to be sitting in. Public markets, right? Yeah. Any well, there's not going to be a call right. right out of the gate, right? So it's it right. rests in there until. So um, that's right. I would just, I you know, if folks want to um, sit with this Vanguard presentation on their own, and uh, we can, you know, it's a nice thing. Brian's at every meeting, <laughs> so. <laughs> so um, I, unless people have very specific questions they would like to bring up now, it's fine. Um, or if they just want to flip through this on their own time and come back and say, you know, I looked at this and um, yeah, right. now's, the, now's the time to do it. Um, because it, the way it's slated now is our private equity is going to double because at a bare minimum, you can think of it as the hedge fund money, um, which actually is not going to come out until later well, either. Anyway, some of it's going to, uh, half of it will come out on 630. Um, it's the Wellington Archipelago, right? That has a longer lockup, right. and so that'll be September. Well, really October 930. So you can almost think of it as the money's rolling out of a private uh, or hedge fund vehicle into into it's this, although it goes in over time. Um, but from a big picture sort of perspective, and um, yeah, and so mm -hmm. that strikes you as kind of whatever people can ask um bring your questions but uh thank you uh ariel and um and brian and uh you know uh yeah if you could give well so the update is essentially the stuff is moving at the end of the month the bulk of it um the bulk of it is it moving at the end of the month everything on the public side and the hedge fund side is moving at the end of the month next which is hard to believe next week and what's staying, of course, is we're not touching the private equity. We're not touching the private real estate. No intentions on either of those. And then the archipelago can't happen until the third quarter, which is about 5%. Um, so yeah, your point in the meantime will be invested, fully invested in public equity. If and when down the road we invest additionally into private equity, that would be the source of funds is the public markets, public equity markets. So perhaps when that dust is clear, we can come back and shake the tree a little bit and see if folks have questions. And we are missing, resting a, a handful of folks too. Um, but we should in the in the um, in the July. We don't meet in August, so in the July meeting, we should be able to. Um, folks who hope they've got this these materials so hopefully they can um get a chance to get up to speed and can answer any um lagging questions and then um funnel those to me yes and and the other great document is that public private the public private memorandum the ppm document PPM. That we're to have. it's huge but um you know there are certain pieces that you can you can get to that shouldn't be too bad 
Excellent. All right. Uh, so going to the back to the agenda, the next item is something that um, well, who knows how long it'll take. It's uh, legal monitoring services, I believe, right? Do you want Vanguard to stay on, Brian, or drop off? Um, I'm happy to stay on. Yeah, my, my, in just in case something comes up in the CFO report. Um, should Maybe I'll have take Brian that. and Ariel drop off. That sounds great. Um, Thanks so much, team. Really appreciate the discussion. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So um, attached in the distribution, there was a thing from um, Palmer, two things from Pomerantz, I guess, glossy brochures. And then there was one from um, Wolf Popper LLP, which is new, although folks may not even realize what the Pomerantz one. So what this stuff is, is we as... Uh, fiduciaries, right? We, we're overseeing all these um, investments. And um, when companies uh, do bad things, um, they usually get hit by, sometimes they get hit and go to jail. Um, sometimes they get hit by regulators and get like fines. And then there's a third remedy that's out there for change. And it's um, because we're we're shareholders, right? We're stakeholders in these companies. We actually have rights to demand remedy when companies just do things they shouldn't do and they damaged the stock price. They dam damaged our holdings. And um, so that's called securities litigation. So, um, and you even get it as if you own stock individually at home, um, not in a mutual fund, but if you, if you own, uh, you're, you got IBM stock or Coca-Cola or what you, you, you have these same very same rights and you can join class actions as a shareholder and there are lawsuits, class actions generally, and there's settlements and their money would flow back. And those of you who have done it or gotten checks in the mail for like a buck 50 or whatever, that's, <laughs> that's, that's uh, generally how you're getting that for, for the town of Fairfield. We just got a check. Uh, Caitlin, do you remember what this? We didn't. We got a four-figure check here recently, didn't we? Like a, over a thousand bucks. I forget what case it was, but yeah, no, we did. So I don't. Um, and it ebbs and flows. Um, and Pomerantz. So what these law firms do is they monitor uh, or offer to monitor our portfolios for free, um, and alert us to or file for us to make sure that we get any payments that um, we would be entitled to as a shareholder. Um, you know, we make sure we just get those monies, which is important, right? Because, um, I mean, shoot, I, if it's, you know, a thousand, 10,000, I mean, we're talking about like hiring an actuary and we pay the actuary for you. I mean, you could literally, you know, we can cover expenses from some of these, it's, it's, it's real money to the trust and it's, um, it's money that if we didn't get it, um, then you know ultimately uh, either employee contributions or taxpayers would be kind of filling that that void. Um, and so right now we just have one law firm. We have Pomerantz, and they I, I don't have anything bad to say about Pomerantz. Uh, Matt Tassillo is the lawyer. He actually lives in town. He did come and speak. And I, I'm getting old. I can't remember when that was or how long they've been doing it. It's been a couple of years, I guess. Um, and at one point in time, we had another law firm, Bernstein Litowitz, but I, they literally, uh, I don't know what happened. They fell off the, the grid. Um, but Matthew has, you know, he delivers these checks. We get them deposited. He tells us where stuff is. Any given time, we can, he sends out like a monthly report, I think, or a bi-monthly report about different lawsuits and our exposure. Um, so what they get is they get to see through our custodian all our exposures to all the various investments. So whether it's IBM or Coca-Cola or whatever, they know on any given date how much the town of Fairfield had an exposure. So if something bad happens and the stock price drops, like they, they know it, they see it. And if they see a lawsuit filed, they 
they can make sure that we pursue remedy. Um, and then what they kind of want, but cannot officially ask for, but can only hope for, is that if a lawsuit comes up and we suffer a big enough loss, they can hope to be uh, to be the lead law firm on a class action lawsuit. So it's it's not officially a quid pro quo. It can't be a quid pro quo. We don't have to use them as a law firm. We can go with anybody, but um, we are co lead plaintiff in a um, actually it's a decent sized lawsuit against Floor F L U O R. It's a Fortune 500 company that did a little bit of tiddlywinks with their um, quarterly accounting reporting and um, it came back to bite them and they had to uh, fess up to it and the stock dropped by over 10%. And I think we as a town suffered a $90,000 loss in that company. And we're currently a, a lead plaintiff and that involves some little bit of work on the town side, um, but we get some benefits from that. But anyway, I'm bringing it up because I want people to know that we have that service out there and that we, we do utilize it and why we utilize it. Um, you look at it, if we didn't, we'd be leaving money on the ground. Um, and I'm bringing Wolf Popper forward because um, I think, you know, because it costs us nothing. And if Pomerantz is telling us one thing, and that's the only voice we hear, um, we could ask our town council, Mr. Baldwin, to opine, but that's really not his forte. So it's not a bad idea to have at least two law firms looking at your portfolio because um, one could tell you something, you can go to the other one and get their opinion. Um, one could alert you to a lawsuit that's going on and money's that are thing and the other guy could forget it or not see it. So, I mean, it's, it's good to have additional coverage. So I wanted um, everybody to get a chance to flip through those, ask any questions if you don't understand what I just went over. Brian, why did you select Wolf Popper? Uh, I mean, I don't know a thing about the landscape here. Um, I would imagine there are lots of firms that do this. I'm, I'm curious as to why you pulled this one forward for us. Oh, it's reverse inquiry in both of these. Um, and Bernstein, and they 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 came to us, um, and it's interesting. Um, we're, we're not very big in the in the landscape as a asset holder, right? So I don't know what I don't know what level interests them, or um, you know, at the you know at the five hundred million, you know, half a billion is that get their attention? Is it the 1 billion? Um, I think that's why Bernstein just signed us up and then forgot about us or just didn't care. Um, because, right, it, it, it takes, it costs them something to do this. And <laughs> so I, you, you got to think that they're hoping that there's some sort of a lawsuit at some point in time, maybe that, that they, you know, that they, they can get a chance at, um, I mean, I, I don't sit in their seat, so but I'll take the I'll take anything that's free, and certainly I'll take it from more than one firm to put them against each other. Um, what I do know about Wolf Popper is I've run into them. Um, I spoke uh, recently at a conference before COVID. Uh, so nicely, I got I got to go down to a Key West in uh, was it February or January to speak about Bernie Madoff. Um, and the town's experience in that. And um, and Wolf Popper actually led that discussion. It was like a pension investor conference. Um, and um, so I got to know them then, and I've seen them at a couple other conferences. They are not, um, France is one of the top 10 firms uh, year after year in securities litigation. So they're, they're kind of like the, you know, the blue chippers. Um, Wolf Popper used to be like that uh, before my time, like, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they sort of gotten squeezed out by these top 10 firms today. But they have a very good monitoring platform. And they said, you know, we can monitor your stuff and identify things for you. And I said, you know, shoot. I was like, yeah, I'll bring the presentation to the board. I mean, I, like I said, the 
not a yeah. crisis thing. I'm like, so, okay. so if I get it, so if I if I understand this right, kind of their business model, at least as as it would relate to us, is their business model is they have a robust securities monitoring program. They gain access to all of our holdings. They they in an iterative process run through our holdings through their monitoring system. If they were to ever pick something up, they present it to us and then I would assume they would pitch us as to the rationale for why we should try to seek remedy and then why we should try to seek remedy using their services. Yeah, and that's why it's interesting to have more than one. Yeah. Right. So if like Pomerantz brought floor to us and quite honestly, we didn't have uh, a second opinion. And um, you know, we're we're down the path now. But um and even if it's not something where we could seek remedy, uh, it's just getting us filed. So just being aware of other lawsuits that other, you know, that we we, we have a claim in, but then Palmer yeah. is involved in, just um, making sure that we get all those. And that's a whole other monitoring sort of a thing going on. That's actually monitoring actual lawsuits, not just our lawsuits and our holdings. So, yeah. So, and, and I'm assuming that we would not be taking on any undue or incremental risk in doing so, apart from disclosing or sharing with them our list of holdings. Yeah, and even on that, there's attorney, there's attorney client privilege, so they can't, they're not, you know, the, the doc, the engagement letter specific, specifically says they can't, you know, they're not sharing um, our holdings with anyone. They, they can't. So, no, I don't see it. Um, there's no, I don't, there's zero risk. So to diligence this, to diligence this, I'm assuming we're, uh, you know, I wouldn't know how to begin to diligence one firm versus another here, uh, apart from asking their, the methodology behind their security screening um, and their track record, I guess, their success rate. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is you could have 10 of these going on and you really don't have to care about it. I mean, if, if, uh, if eight of them totally were were worthless it doesn't really it you know all it is is a document you sign and they get access to people's or if we shifted to a different custodian i mean um they just get a feed and it, you know, so um i mean yeah you want folks that obviously um i don't want 10 because and having eight that are worthless um you know you prefer to have a few that have a system that's good enough I'm not going out seeking them out because, like I said, at our size, there might be law firms that are not even interested in us. We um, there is another law firm that has got a Greenwich office that they um, they've seen me speaking at pension and investments conferences and stuff, and so they also reached out. And I I, I just been I I played a little bit of uh, email tag, and I don't know much about them. Um, but that's potentially a third firm that's interested in there. Um, they're not one of the top 10 and I can't even remember the name of them. I, and I know they have an office, I believe in Greenwich because that's where the, the, um, the one guy was, uh, out of a Philadelphia office, but he had a, um, a Connecticut space. But I mean, diligence wise, I just know, um, I do not know the interests. I, I do know that Pomerantz has a pretty decent platform, whether it's theirs or their, their bought somebody else's software, I don't know. Um, but they do produce a decent report. This so, so if something, if something untowered or God forbid, illegal fraudulent happens at a company that's in our, in one of our securities holdings, um, how which could have happened by the way, we could own Wirecard. I mean, I, right? I'm just waiting to hear about that. Right. I, I mean, it, it absolutely can happen. Um, but are we rely, are we trying to select these monitoring companies based on their ability to predict the likelihood of this happening? No, They're no. just the first to notice some type of legal action that includes these companies. No, your asset managers are the ones that are supposed to. I mean, there's no, if there's a fraud predictor tool, we ought to we ought to, <laughs> we ought to find that one and sign up for it right away. But um, no, these are. Uh, they are. They're very much um, 
reactionary, right? They're waiting for the. And are they all are they all using the same databases to source the information? Do you think? No, I can tell you they're using, like, they're they're looking at they're looking at headlines. Well, I don't I don't. The most rudimentary ones um, are just literally looking at Bloomberg feeds, right? All you got to do is get a feed from all the global markets, right? Because we're not just in U.S. equities; we're in global. Equities. So they monitor globally any stock that moves. Uh, you know, more than 1% different, this is what I'm guessing the screen is, moves at least 1% different than the rest of the market. So in other words, you know, it's not just absolute, it's relative to the rest of the market, meaning it's something, you know, something's causing that company to move uh, and and also doing a headline search because um, sometimes they don't always mesh up, especially after hours, you know, that's what companies like to say. You know, I don't remember how Wirecard broke, but you know, oh yeah, we lost two billion dollars. We can't find it. Whatever, you know, I don't know when they released that news, uh, and then their stock has dropped by like seventy five percent since then. Like that, and um, and now they just arrested the prior CEO. But I mean, that would be an example where uh, whether it was a headline or the stock movement, all these different law firms should have had alarm bells going off, and then they would have looked at it. Um, because they're going to they're going to wait to see a lawsuit filed or they're going to see did Fairfield did one of our managers in emerging like core states right I think those are our first states or I can't remember the name of our emerging manager they, did they have like some big outsized bet on on Wirecard in which case you know we took it in the kisser and if so you know they would calculate kind of roughly what we lost and start pondering whether and looking at the details of what that company did to see if it was uh you know it broke the law and so, as such was prosecutable under securities litigation um so that's that's what they're doing and it you know it's um it's good to know it's happened i mean when we when i uh 10 years ago when we joined the board we didn't have any of this um you know and i would say that uh like the law firm that we're currently using to look into that other matter. Um, they're not big enough to do this sort of stuff, but I mean, if you wanted to get an opinion from them, you know, they could tell you why it's probably, it's a kind of a no brainer to have um, some of these services turned on um, at the very least to make sure that you're getting money from filings and it's coming in because if we were to ask Caitlin or, or, or our town to, um, work with people's bank because technically custodians can do some of this for you, right? Because they know all your holdings and they could file for you. But in this day and age, even the big ones are saying, we, we, we don't get paid enough to do that. It's too much of a pain in the neck. And I can guarantee you people's isn't doing it for us. It's just right. not happening. So that's, these guys are sort of filling a void. Right. So, so bringing Wolf Popper into the picture here, is this something that you would kind of want us to to vote on tonight? Or is this something you think that we would kind of sit back and then maybe talk about it for next month? I mean, it's an interesting idea. It makes it, it as you describe it, as the presentation is laid out, it makes sense to have have folks monitoring our positions. Yeah, it's a weird thing, but I, I know it a little better than. Um... Yeah. The average bear because i um for folks who don't know what i do for a living i serve as a testifying expert on all things financial and capital markets so derivatives options uh, real estate leveraged loans you know whatever i've testified on all sorts of stuff and i usually either hired to work with one of these firms like these firms hire me or um the the companies that did something wrong or the um you know if it's a you know if it's a if it's alliance you know i can be i get high, whatever i whoever wants to hire me for my expertise to give opinion I, I will give an opinion like i don't i don't have to see it the way they see it i'll look at it on my own and come up with hey i get paid by the hour but um so i've yeah i've been playing in this space uh a lot for the past 10 years so um I do know it pretty well, and I, I would recommend it. I we we have an engagement. We have yeah, I guess it's an engagement letter that Wolf Popper. It's basically 
we have to authorize them to have access to look at our portfolio. So um, I don't know if we even put it before the board for Pomerantz or how that happened or if the town just did it or um, <laughs> I, I think Mike Tetro and Bob signed it maybe. Uh, I can ask Matt Tassilla who actually signed that. Um, I do know now he asked me to sign stuff when, um, like for the floor litigation stuff, so to sign on behalf of a, the board as far as whatever, like, you know, they've got the thing and they get, and then he brings the checks and I have to help, uh, or whatever, right? brings them to Caitlin and we make sure they get deposited. But um, I, I wouldn't mind, um, I guess, a vote to allow Wolf Popper to do a monitoring service. I don't know that our agenda says that though. So that's what I'm doing. Right. And do we have to do a diligence? Do we have to do a conflict check at all for anyone? I mean, I would assume not, right? This would not fall underneath. Does anyone have any relationships with Wolf Popper? I'm assuming we don't have that issue with this situation. Uh, I would think that they would, wouldn't bring it to us. And I, I'm not quite sure how it would even parlay into a, um, I don't know. benefit but no i don't have a, a relationship with them i have never worked for them um and i have never worked for pomerantz either uh, oddly enough i've worked for me worked for bernstein <laughs> that, who never did anything uh for us but um uh, but no and i don't i don't see a conflict issue or a risk issue like i said um and let me look and see what the it just says legal securities monitoring services so it doesn't say act um which we could do, or I could just, we could just put it on the agenda for now. If, Chris, if you could remember that to say, um, uh, act on legal securities monitoring services by Wolf Popper for mm -hmm. July. I appreciate that. And okay. We, uh, on, um, CFO report. Brian, I got a question. Um, wait, wait, oh, go ahead. Who's, who's got the question? Oh, this, this this is Eric, Eric Newman. Uh, does it have right. to go to an RFP at all? I think that like, or, or we don't have to file RFPs and put out a bid if we're going. For well, there's no bids. money. It doesn't no cost money. us anything. Okay. So yeah, so it's like, I guess a no, a no cost RFP. I mean, I, you know, it's a, um, I would be scared if we put out, uh, <laughs> I wonder how many responses we, although, you know, they come and seek you out. You know, it's always been a, you know, this reverse, inquiry and i i think that we're just kind of too tiny and does stanford have it do you guys have services um looking into it but you know same thing we have like if lawyers come approaching us all the time about it so you know we don't have i would i would highly service. encourage you to do it just to make sure that you're getting all your filing done and um i don't have anything bad to say about pomerantz just um you know just uh, I think they've been very uh, attentive, um, maybe because he lives here. Who knows? <laughs> but um, anyway, so we'll, um, but yeah, if you want to talk about more, you definitely know where to find me. Um, CFO report. Okay, um, nothing, you know, too dramatic. We, clearly the June 1 payments went out. Um, on June 3rd, as I think we discussed at the end of our um, meeting in May, we had the 2 million left of the 6 million that was raised from site. So under the guidance of Vanguard, we moved that 2 million to um, BlackRock. So that was early June. That was June 3rd, just to keep it invested prior to needing money for our 7-1 payout. Um, we also, I think we also touched on this in the last May meeting, we had some cash in our OPEB account. Uh, so again, yeah. under under um, Vanguard's guidance, we actually invested, um, it was about $2.3 million in a split between Vanguard US stock and Vanguard international stock between the town and the police and fire OPEB account. And then lastly, just recently for the 7-1 payments, um, again, Vanguard looked at where we were last Friday. So we took a million nine, which I think Brian actually mentioned in his presentation from PIMCO for those seven one payments. So we are all set now for the July payment. So that's gonna be separate. That's now set aside because we have this old transitioning thing going on with all the other managers. Um, but that, because people's needed it um, 
earlier. So that is now with people. Excellent. So we are all good. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Any old business? Hearing none. New business? None there. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Eric Caliper, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Eric. A second. I'll second. Thank you, Chris. Uh, all in favor? <laughs> uh, Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully, and if there are any questions about private equity, we can email Brian directly. You can ask me, and I'll get the answer. But I um, take a flip to that deck. It's got some good stuff in it, and um, obviously, it's going to be a chunk. Well, potentially, going to be a big chunk of the portfolio in the future. And um, yeah, you want all the rest is going to pretty much be in an index. So if you got something you want to focus your attention on, that would be a good place to. Uh, Good place to spend some time. Right. Before you guys, before you guys hang up, is uh, Tom McCarthy on? He sent an email. Right. Said something about. He said, "Uh, oh, he said he might be able to make it." So I guess he did not. All right. So we don't have a quorum for the police and fire retirement. Oh, I see your point. Yeah. Is Brian C. Bruce Ryan on and? Ken and Eric. Eric, Eric, yeah. Eric and Ken, yeah. Wow. Okay. She'll have to reschedule it. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. This session is no longer being recorded. Goodbye.